Reprise the debate, resuming the debate. The Honourable Member for South Okanagan, West Kootenai. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. And I'm, I'm happy to have the opportunity today to speak to this debate about Bill C-63, the second act implementing the budget tabled last March in this place. And it's a big bill, 329 pages, amending 19 pieces of legislation. Mm. And it's unfortunate that in recent years, budget implementation bills have become so enormous and that the government allows so little time for their debate and study that we cannot possibly discuss them effectively. And this one changes labour laws, lays the foundation for Canada's membership in the Asia Infrastructure Bank. And, you know, I know there's been a point of order raised about this bill, whether it can be legally considered an omnibus bill under the new Standing Order 69, and so I won't, I won't comment on that, but it's just that it's sheer size uh, is concerning. Now you think in all those pages there would be a lot of good news for Canadians and there are a few bits of sunshine there particularly in provisions that would change the labour code to make it a more flexible place and place some protections uh, for unpaid interns mm. and you know we here in the NDP uh, would like to see some of these provisions go a bit further but in general we salute any measures that recognize the difficulties that workers face these days. And so these changes are certainly a step in the right direction. And I also like to point out that there are some other things I, I was happy to see here, uh, support for geothermal projects, or, uh, very tepid, as my colleague uh, from Sandwich Gulf Island said, uh, subsidies for reduction in subsidies for fossil fuel industries. Uh, so there are some some good uh, issues here that were raised uh, in this bill, but really there could have been so much more good news in such a huge bill, and uh, we're very disappointed in what's actually missing. And before the budget was tabled last March, uh, the NDP sent the Finance Minister a letter outlining some of the things that we thought could and should be done to really help average Canadians, really help the middle class and those wanting to join it. Um, and I'd like to talk a bit about these items that were missing in the budget, and these are truly missed opportunities to help Canadians. And first, there's Pharmacare. I know the Parliamentary Budget Officer came out with a report only recently that showed that we could save over $4 billion a year if we, in Canada, if we instituted a universal Pharmacare program that offered free prescription drugs to all Canadians. That's right, we could save billions of dollars while providing free prescription drugs. Canadians would be wealthier and healthier. Now, the finance minister didn't have access to that report, so perhaps that's why he didn't include it in the budget, but there were other, other <coughs> earlier reports, just as credible, that estimated even larger savings, over $11 billion a year under the same program. And then the Liberals voted against an NDP motion last month that simply called for talks with the province to to begin within a year to look at how such a program could be structured. So I'm hoping that this just isn't a case of the government not wanting to give credit to the NDP for such a good idea uh, that would make life better for all Canadians, and that by next spring they'll quietly slip Universal Pharmacare into the 2018 budget. And it's better late than ever. Another item that the Liberals forgot to include in the 2017 budget, and the 2016 budget for that matter, is their promise to do away with CEO stock option tax loopholes. That would have saved Canadians over $750 million a year. And the Liberals promised it in the last election. But no, they decided not to go after CEOs, and instead this summer went after small businesses across the country, going after the small fry, the minnows, instead of the big fish. And speaking of big fish, we also asked the Finance Minister to enact legislation in the budget to close down offshore tax havens. Now the Paradise Papers have shown, shown us why they might not have wanted to do that, to protect the Liberals that are using those tax havens to avoid paying, paying their fair share of taxes in Canada. And I have to say in passing that it's a little ironic to hear the Conservatives asking the Finance Minister about Morneau Chappelle's <coughs> tax shelter in the Barbados when it was their government who signed the tax treaty with Barbados to allow Morna Chappelle to avoid paying their fair share. But the inaction on the part of the Liberals 
fact, they keep on creating offshore tax havens. Uh, they just signed a new treaty with the Cook Islands. It's just as disappointing. We also asked the finance minister to institute a $15 an hour minimum wage for federal workers. This would have been a great signal to the country that the federal government recognized that many hardworking Canadians cannot possibly live on the minimum wages they receive for their work. Now the move for a $15 an hour minimum wage has been taken up by the governments in BC and Alberta and hopefully that good policy will spread across this country and hopefully the federal government will make that move for federal workers in next year's budget. We also asked the Minister about the Eco Energy Retrofit Program. And Madam Speaker, I'd like to spend some time on that subject that it's one that's close to my heart. I actually tabled a private member's motion uh, that called on the government to reintroduce the Eco Energy Retrofit Program because it's one of those government initiatives that are actually a win, 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 Ooh. win for government, for the economy, for homeowners, and for the environment. This popular program ran from 2007 to 2012 and helped hundreds of thousands of Canadians retrofit their homes, lowering their energy bills by 20%, creating thousands of good local jobs and reducing greenhouse gas emissions by three tonnes per year for each house. While the program cost the federal government $900 million over five years, it leveraged more than $4 billion in retrofit wow. investments by Canadian families. So the government got five times the economic impact from its investment. And when homeowners invest in new windows, insulation and other energy saving projects, when they shop at building supply stores in their own communities, that money circulates through their communities and across the country. And when I talk to the Canadian Home Builders Association here or in my riding, they remind me of the huge positive impact that program had on their members and homeowners everywhere. Mm -hmm. They really noticed the negative impact when the program unfortunately was cancelled. Mm -hmm. This government wants infrastructure investment, they want to reduce carbon emissions, they want to help the middle class and the Eco Energy Retrofit program would be a perfect way to do all of that, a proven way. Something the federal government could get started on right away because it has been done before. And I know it was a Conservative government that did before, and the NDP have been reminding the Liberals that it's a good idea, but it's really too good an idea to let partisan politics get in the way. Now, I could go on, Madam Speaker, but I think I'll stop here. Suffice to say that Bill C-63, like the budget itself, has been a huge missed opportunity for this government and for all Canadians. We will all have to wait for next year for an improvement, but it will be more than a day late and a dollar short. Thank you. Bravo.